Now that we've talked about control volumes and conservation of mass, let's move on to the other conservation equations. And I'm going to start next with conservation of momentum. Now you've studied momentum and transfer of momentum in physics. So if you take pool balls and you roll one into another, it might stop and then transfer its momentum to the other ball. So moving objects can transfer the momentum from one to another. It's the same with fluids, although it's a little more complicated because, again, we're not dealing with discrete objects. For example, if you have a fire hose that's spraying a lot of water at a high flow rate, um, it can take two or sometimes three or four people to brace the end of that hose and absorb the force and, and keep it pointed in the right direction because the water is going to exert a lot of force on the end of that hose, and it takes, it, it takes some big burly people to keep that in place. Similarly, um, we can use jets of water. These are called high pressure jets to do things like cut steel and concrete and aluminum. Um, they exert a, a, a huge amount of force over a very small area if it's if this is uh, manufactured correctly. And so this is, is an example of a high pressure jet cutting steel to call it a high-pressure jet is actually kind of a misnomer, um, though. If As soon as the water exits that pipe, as soon as it becomes a free jet and it's out in the atmosphere, it's actually no longer under pressure, right? By nature, it's not pressurized anymore because it's not contained in anything. You can only have pressure in a contained pipe or a tube or, you know, some sort of container that's holding the, the liquid under pressure. Um, so as soon as it jets out, it's no longer under pressure. It's really the, the transfer of momentum from the fluid to the solid that provides that force. So it's not a pressure force. It's really a, a transfer of momentum. Okay, for conservation of momentum, we need to start it the same way we do with conservation of mass. Our first step is to set up a control volume. And then this is the equation for conservation of momentum that's in the FE handbook. In the textbook, it's quite a bit different, um, but you can, you can convert from one to the other. I'm going to use this because it's in the FE handbook, and I think it's a little more approachable. It's a little more obvious what we're talking about. Um, there's three terms here. On the left-hand side of the equation, we have external forces acting on the control volume. So these are all forces outside the control volume acting on it, on the surface of it. And no, notice that it's a vector. This is a vector equation, so we can rewrite this equation in the three directions. Now, on the right-hand side of the equal sign are fluxes. And we've got all the fluxes, or all, in this case, all the momentum exiting the control volume and all the momentum entering the control volume. This equation just has two terms. You could have three or four terms if you have several pipes all coming in at one point, and you can just keep tacking them on. Um, so these terms are flow rate times density times the velocity. And notice the velocity is a vector. So this being a vector equation, we can rewrite it in with its components in the three directions. So the force now becomes a component, and the velocities now, compo now become a component. Um, keep in mind that the Q that's buried in there, that's, if you substitute in V1, A1 for that, which you're, you can do, notice that that V is the full V. It's not the component V like the other V. So when you start playing around with these equations, make sure you don't make that mistake. That, You've got one component velocity, but then you've also got one full velocity. Okay, those external forces on the left-hand side of the equation, they can be a couple different things. One obvious, obvious thing is, is gravity. Is, so the weight of the control volume or the weight of the fluid within the control volume may contribute. Um, pressure acting from outside the control volume onto the surface of it. That can be a force that you have to consider. And then the reaction force, the force that we're usually solving for, the force to hold something in place. So that's basically the theory of conservation momentum. Um, this, this one's 
easier to understand by example. So I'm going to do a bunch of examples now. Um, okay, so this first one, we've got a nozzle that's spraying water up into the atmosphere, and it's it's um, it's held down right at that horizontal seam that you can see there. And the question is, how much force, how much vertical force is required to hold that in place? And we're given the angle, we're given the surface areas, we're given the flow rate, we're given the weight of the nozzle, so that's the actual metal part, and then the internal volume of it, and then the pressure coming in, the pressure in the pipe. Notice that it's spraying into the atmosphere, and as soon as it exits into the atmosphere, the pressure is zero. Okay, so the first thing we do is define our control volume. Pretty obvious what we want to define. We've got two surfaces where we have flux crossing our control volume, surface one and surface two. We can now write our conservation of momentum, and we're just going to use the Z component because that's what we're interested in, that vertical anchoring force. And we've got two fluxes. We've got at surface two it's exiting, so that term is positive, and at surface one it's entering, so that term is negative. Okay, let's look at our external forces. We've got our anchoring force, which we're solving for, and I'm going to arbitrarily draw it down. I could draw it either way. We've got the weight of the nozzle itself. We've also got to consider the weight of the water inside the nozzle. And then there's pressure within that pipe. So there's a pressure force pushing upward on the control volume. We can put those together in the equation. Be careful of the signs. You have to be really careful of this, your sign convention when you use conservation momentum. Um, so the pressure force is upward, and the other three are all downward, so the other three are negative. Notice that I've factored out the Q. I'm using conservation of mass here. Flow rate in has to equal the flow rate out, so Q1 has to equal Q2. It's all water, so I'm using, I factored out the density as well. And then we've got the vertical, vertical components of force. I'm sorry, the vertical components of the velocity. Now, the, well, I've done a few substitutions here. The force of pressure is the pressure times the cross-sectional area. The weight of the water is rho g times the volume of the apparatus. And then I've inserted the vertical components. For one, it's the vo velocity one is directly upwards, so there is no component to it. And... Um, for velocity 2, it comes out at an angle, so we have to use sine theta. Now, let's, you have to be very careful about the signs, both on the left-hand side of the equation and the right-hand side. If we look at surface 2, we have water exiting the, volu the control volume, so that makes it positive. And it's also going upwards, which is a positive direction, so that's also positive. For the second, for the control volume 1, the flow is entering the control volume, so it's negative, and it's also in an upward direction, so it's positive. So keep that in mind as you use this equation that for each of those terms on the right, you have two things to think about for the sign convention, whether it's entering and exiting, and then also the, the vector direction, whether it's upwards or downwards or left or right. Okay, now we have to come up with some numbers to put in our equation. We need the velocity, which is Q over A. We calculate that. Since the flow rates are the same, the other velocity is also Q over A. We can calculate that. And now we've got all of our numbers. We plug in all those numbers and solve for the force of area. Uh, I'm sorry, the anchoring force. And that gives us a positive 482 newtons. So it's positive, meaning that I drew it correctly, and the force is acting downwards. Okay, this one's a little bit different. In this case, we have a gate that's holding back water. And with this gate, the water travels underneath the gate, and it typically forms a hydraulic jump behind it, and then results in a different, um, different flow depth after it. This is common for open channel flow, that you'll have different depths and velocities depending on what's going on with the river and what happened in the past in the river. 
Um, all right, I'm going to start by drawing a control volume. I've got two control surfaces entering and exiting. Notice that I've drawn the control volume so it goes right up against the gate. So now I can talk about the gate pushing on the control volume. Consider that as an external force. Um, other forces I've got in open channel flow, so I've got this column of water, or I've got uh, a depth of water on the left hand side, which is pushing on this. So I've got a hydrostatic force pushing on that planar surface, and I've got that on both sides. Okay, we're going to use the x component of the conservation of momentum equation. We can put in our forces in the proper directions. So um, the hydrostatic force on the left-hand side is in the positive direction, but the other two forces are in the negative direction. Again, I factored out Q and rho, and I have the two velocities. Now let's look at. Let's be very careful about the signs here again. So for surface two, it's exiting, which makes it positive, and it's going from left to right, which is the positive direction, so that's positive also. For surface one, it's entering, which makes it negative, and it's, in a po it's going left to right, which is a positive direction. We have to go back to chapter two to remember how to calculate the resultant force on a, on a planar surface. Um, if you remember, it's gamma HCA, where HC is the distance from the water surface, to the centroid of the planar surface. For the first surface, that's three feet from the top to the middle. And then the area is 60 square feet. That gives us a force. On the other side, it's a little bit different. It's two feet to get from the water surface to the center. And it's 40 square feet, which gives us a much lower total force. <clears throat> And then the flow rate, we're not given, but we can calculate it using the velocity times the area. Um, the second velocity, we can calculate from the flow rate divided by the area. And we can plug all those in to the equation and solve for the anchoring force. It gives an anchoring force of 5,280 pounds. And it's, again, it's positive, so I drew the force in the correct direction. So the gate is pushing on the water or in other words, the water is pushing on the gate. Okay, the last example I'm going to do is another one of these pipe bends. Um, we're going to start by drawing a control volume. You notice I've drawn it to come right up to the, the pressure gauge, so I know what the pressure is on one surface, and the other surface is right where the water jets into the atmosphere, so I know what the pressure is there as well. Okay, so I've got two control surfaces where water is entering and exiting. Um, now we're given the anchoring force, and what we're trying to find in this problem is the flow rate. We're given the anchoring force in the x direction, so I'm going to use the x component of the momentum equation. Our only other um, external force is the force of pressure pushing on surface 1. So I've got my external forces with the proper sign and then I've factored out Q and Rho again using conservation of mass and then I've got the horizontal components of velocity for the two surfaces. Now let's look at the signs again. For surface 2 water is exiting the control volume so it's positive but it's going from right to left, so it's going in a negative direction. So that makes that term negative. And then for surface 1, it is entering the control volume, which gives it a negative sign. And it's going from left to right, so that's positive. So that term becomes negative. Okay, so both in this case, both these terms end up being negative. Um, we need to solve for flow rate and the equation I have there is given in terms of velocities. So we have to get rid of those velocities and um, I'm going to plug in, I'm going to substitute those velocities for Q over A 
and then solve for Q. And now we have all the other numbers we need to solve this. We just plug them in and solve for Q. And Q is, works out to be around 7 cubic feet per second.